Okay, so today uh, what I want to do is to start discussing uh, um, the, um, what is called general equilibrium theory, which is essentially the theory that uh, uh, describes uh, uh, economies uh, as a, say, uh, the, the behavior of economies starting from their, uh, uh, the behavior of individuals, which is what uh, economists call uh, micro foundations. Uh, it's a little bit like uh, what we do in uh, statistical mechanics, uh, where we discuss uh, uh, the properties of matter, uh, starting from uh, the fundamental equations of uh, motion for particles. Okay, and their interaction. Okay, so this is a uh, uh, general theory that has been uh, developed in the uh, in the last century, uh, mostly say around the fifties. And um, so, and I hope you have uh, seen the uh, there are some videos on the web page. Uh, and there is a um, there is a lecture uh, of um, uh, given an introductory lecture to um, uh, microeconomics. Um, that essentially explains a little bit uh, the general framework, and I think uh, this is very instructive to. Uh, think about uh, uh, to realize how economists uh, uh, have been discussing about uh, 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 economy. So um, what I want to do, uh, of course, in this hour is to just give you a very uh, uh, um, brief sketch of the main ideas uh, going through uh, the different, uh, the main results, okay? And, um, okay. So I hope, um, I'm trying to share my screen, uh, let me see. Okay. Um, okay, very good. So, Okay, so uh, what I want to describe is what is called the uh, general equilibrium theory. So how do you describe in general an, an economy? So in an economy, there are three main actors. Uh, one actor is uh, what are called uh, uh, consumers. And uh, these are uh, essentially the, the, the household, the individuals, okay? And the other actor uh, is what are uh, called uh, firms. And the third act actor is uh, markets. Okay, so um, essentially these three elements uh, interact with each other. So, uh, for example, say consumers, uh, they uh, work uh, in firms. Uh, so they, they receive uh, uh, salaries, wages from the firm they work on, but they also own the firms. Okay, they own shares of the firms, okay. Then uh, uh, essentially consumers, uh, what they do, what is name uh, tells is uh, uh, they, um, they consume uh, goods that uh, they buy in the markets. Okay, so and this is uh, what uh, uh, gives rise to what is called a demand. And um, uh, but also uh, they also sell uh, what they have in uh, uh, in the markets. So in the end, uh, 
in this economy, in this view of an economy, everything uh, is owned uh, by the consumers. So even uh, um, so consumers uh, are born with their endowments, uh, which is what they own uh, to start with. And then uh, they trade in markets in order to buy goods uh, uh, to, uh, to consume and to maximize their uh, uh, utility, okay? So, uh, okay, and what do fir firms uh, do? Well, uh, uh, they essentially um, uh, buy inputs uh, from the markets. They transform these inputs. Uh, they, I mean, inputs uh, are like uh, a raw material. And then uh, uh, they produce uh, an output, uh, which is essentially what, uh, uh, what is the supply uh, to the market, okay? So um, uh, among the inputs, uh, of course, uh, there is also uh, work. Uh, there is also labor. So indeed, uh, uh, essentially, the, the consumers, they go to the market. There is a market for labor. And then uh, as a result of this, they sell their, uh, uh, say, labor to uh, firms, uh, and they get uh, wages, uh, OK? So let, let me um, go a little bit uh, um, more in detail on uh, each of these uh, elements. OK, so let's look at uh, uh, what uh, firms do, OK? So uh, firms, uh, let's uh, uh, focus on firms. So firms, uh, they essentially uh, maximize uh, Profit. Okay, uh, what is the uh, profit of a of a firm? Uh, so the the profit of a firm is essentially um, of firm F. If they produce uh, some output Y, is essentially equal to the profit that they make which is just the price, the market price at which they sell these outputs minus the cost of production, okay? The production cost. And this uh, depends on, uh, uh, well, depends on many things, but essentially let me just say that it depends on how much they, they produce. So essentially uh, what the firm has to do is to find uh, the optimal uh, production plan, okay? So which is uh, what uh, maximizes uh, uh, their profit, okay? So um, now uh, the generally, so the, you can see that uh, this uh, uh, problem, if this is Y and this is the cost of production, so when, uh, when you uh, say, let's imagine that the cost of productions are something like this, uh, then uh, when you look at this problem and you maximize, uh, then uh, you take a first derivative of this uh, and you find out that uh, the price, uh, the condition at the maximum is that, uh, uh, sorry, the price will be equal to the first derivative of Y this is what is called the marginal cost. So what uh, firms will do is that uh, they will uh, set uh, the price, the, the, the production schedule in such a way that the marginal costs are equal to the price, okay? Um, now, um, so if uh, say uh, the price, uh, um, let's say that the price uh, is something like this. Uh, so uh, this, this first term, uh, say P times Y is, uh, uh, is essentially, um, this first term P times Y is essentially a linear term. 
Okay, so if the price is small, uh, this is like a line with this slope, huh? then uh, the optimal uh, uh, production will be given by this one, okay? If instead uh, uh, the price is higher, so it's uh, something like this, uh, then uh, uh, the production will be higher, okay? So from this, you can see that uh, uh, what uh, uh, the, the output of a firm, y as a function of p, would be a function of the price. And uh, well, in this case, you can see that uh, it is an increasing function. So if the price is low, then uh, the um, uh, output is small. If the price is high, it is, uh, so it would be something like this. Okay, so this uh, uh, is uh, what uh, uh, the uh, what is essentially the will be the supply of the firms uh, to the market. Okay, are there questions on this? If there are no questions. Do we get the equation of price from the first equation of the profit? Uh, so I mean, equals to C prime of Y. Yeah, this yeah. one. So this comes Do from we get uh, the derivative of pi with respect to Y. So if you uh, take- uh, In the maximum? Yeah. If you take oh. uh, uh, this equation for pi, you take a derivative, then uh, this is the first order condition, no? Okay, so here I'm describing a very simplified uh, uh, um, a problem. I, I mean, indeed, uh, uh, what you can imagine that the cost of production depends on the prices of the inputs and on uh, how much inputs uh, the, the, the firm is taking. So I, I'm, I'm just uh, simplifying all this, uh, just to give you the main idea. Is this clear? Yes, yes. Okay, very good. So let's go then uh, uh, on the other side, uh, which is uh, consumers. So what do the uh, consumers do? Well, the consumers, uh, what they do, what we said uh, is that uh, they uh, maximize uh, the utility of consumption. Okay, so uh, the um, so the consumers uh, they uh, maximize uh, utility of uh, consumption. So uh, means that uh, so there are many uh, so there are many consumers as there are many firms. Huh? So each of them uh, essentially decides uh, how much to consume uh, given a certain value of the price uh, by maximizing uh, a, a utility function that uh, tells them uh, um, how much uh, uh, um, what is the satisfaction that they get from satisfying, uh, uh, from consuming uh, an amount uh, X uh, C of goods, okay? Now, uh, this uh, maximization is constrained by essentially what uh, um, agent uh, C, uh, what uh, uh, consumer C can afford. And this uh, is uh, encoded in this uh, budget set. So the budget set is essentially uh, the set of all uh, uh, consumption bundles such that uh, uh, the cost of this bundle is less or equal than the way, than, than the wealth of uh, uh, consumer C, okay? So this is the wealth. And what is the wealth? Well, the wealth 
is uh, essentially what uh, uh, consumer get uh, by selling uh, their uh, initial endowment. Uh, let me call it W. So these are uh, endowments of consumer C plus uh, uh, whatever they get uh, uh, from uh, the shares of firms uh, uh, of, of the profit of the firms, okay? So uh, as I told you, uh, the uh, uh, consumers also own the firms uh, and uh, firm F, uh, a fraction of fee F uh, of firm F is owned by consumer C. So this should be also depending on C. And so this is uh, essentially the uh, amount of revenue dividends that they get from the firms, okay? Okay. So uh, notice uh, one thing uh, that um, uh, here, the utility uh, of uh, each consumer does not depend on uh, uh, what other consumers uh, consume, say XC prime, okay? So it means uh, that I'm assuming that there is uh, no externality. So the fact that my neighbor uh, consumes uh, 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 eats meat every day does not affect uh, in any way my utility, okay? Uh, now, this uh, may not be true because, say, uh, maybe if you consume meat every day, does barbecue, and then uh, there is some, uh, say, uh, noise or some uh, pollution. Uh, so, this might not be true, but this is what is assumed in this uh, uh, framework. So, I see there are some questions. Okay, is the price of firms selling their product different from the one of whom I'm coming to discuss uh, uh, about prices? And uh, that is the next question, the next issue when we will discuss uh, um, uh, markets. Okay, uh, in this example, we are always take, talking about a single type of product with fixed price, right? We want to describe a more complex situation in which there are lots of different goods. I suppose that the mathematical description would be a lot more difficult. Indeed, it is a lot more difficult. So if you go on the website, uh, the lectures uh, which you will find on the website describe the general situation where essentially you have uh, uh, many goods, many consumers and uh, many firms. Okay, and for each good uh, you have a market, so for each good you have a price. Okay, uh, for this moment, uh, uh, what I wanted to do is just to uh, uh, describe, uh, give you the, the main concepts uh, of uh, the, main, uh, the main ideas. Okay, and uh, so that you get a general picture of uh, how. Um, um, how uh, an economy works, okay, or how it is described in this in these theories, okay. Okay, so uh, now the output of what consumers do is uh, essentially a demand function. So how do you get this? Uh, well, essentially, uh, again, uh, this is an optimization problem. If the utility function of a consumer is like this, uh, then, uh, and uh, if uh, uh, the prices uh, are, uh, uh, if there is a certain vector of prices, uh, then uh, essentially the um, uh, solution uh, for this uh, consumer will be a certain uh, amount of goods uh, at given prices. And then uh, uh, you can uh, write, you can derive what uh, will be uh, the demand function, how much goods will uh, consumers uh, 
the, so this will be for one uh, particular agent, okay? But then uh, you can uh, compute what will be the aggregate uh, demand, which is the sum of all uh, um, consumers, okay? And uh, so, um, now this uh, is what uh, is, uh, uh, is the demand which is uh, submitted uh, uh, to the price, to, to, to the markets, okay? And uh, what do the markets do? Well, uh, they take these two functions. So they take, uh, 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 so this function here and this function here, and uh, they determine what the prices are, okay? So if you plot uh, uh, on one side uh, uh, as a function of the price, the, this is the supply uh, y of p, and this is the demand x of p. So then uh, this, uh, this will be the price, okay? This will be the price of uh, the market. So you see, the, in the general description of an economy, you have consumers uh, that uh, solve an optimization problem at fixed price uh, prices, firms that uh, solve an optimization problem at fixed prices, and uh, uh, the market will uh, um, match the demand from one side with the supply from the other side and determine at what prices uh, the, the, this, uh, the demand is equal to the supply, okay? And this will happen uh, for any good, okay? So this theory does not describe uh, how are, what is the mechanism that uh, uh, fixes the prices, it just described based on the properties of the uh, uh, consumers and based on the properties of the firms, uh, what are the prices that you expect uh, uh, to, uh, to see in the market and how this market uh, also, uh, how these prices will change uh, as you change the uh, characteristics of uh, uh, individuals, okay? So one point uh, that I want to make is that uh, uh, sometimes uh, the equilibrium may not uh, always exist. So for example, even in this simple case, uh, you may realize that uh, say, for example, uh, you may have uh, uh, a, a, a consumption as a, as a marginal, uh, say the cost of production, which are uh, something like this uh, and then like this, okay? Sorry, maybe it's not, uh, uh, that are something like this and then like this, okay? So in this case, uh, uh, you will see that uh, for the same uh, uh, price, okay, you can have uh, two solutions, okay? One solution which is uh, here and one solution which is, uh, um, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, so for, for this uh, price, uh, you can have this solution, but you can also have this solution, okay? So you can have two values of Y for the same uh, price, okay? So this means that uh, the, uh, the curve, the supply can have uh, this uh, uh, feature here, okay? And if you have a, a supply function that has these uh, properties, uh, when you match it uh, with, uh, uh, with the demand, you can get into a situation where uh, the, uh, the demand and the supply do not meet each other, okay? And so the equilibrium does not exist, okay? So uh, generally this problem of uh, existence uh, of uh, equilibrium uh, uh, is related to uh, non-convexities. 
So if you have um, convex, uh, uh, so what you can show is that you, if you have uh, sufficient uh, uh, convexity property on the uh, utility functions and on the production functions, then uh, uh, the equilibrium exists, okay? Then another issue is whether uh, it is unique or it is not unique. Uh, so in order for it to be unique, you have to uh, introduce further assumptions, okay? Okay, so uh, are there other questions? Uh, isn't a bit counterintuitive that the quantity of supplied goods increases uh, when their price increases? No, well, uh, yeah, so this is just an example. It can, uh, you can have a different uh, uh, function for the cost of production. And uh, this will uh, result in a different uh, curve, okay? So it can also be a decreasing curve or it can be a flat curve. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so, so in the real world, uh, you have, uh, I mean, this uh, issue of non-convexities, indeed is something that uh, um, is, uh, applies to the real world, uh, because uh, this is essentially what is called uh, um, increasing returns to scale. So the fact that, uh, your, uh, um, uh, the cost of production, the, the, the marginal cost of production, maybe uh, in some part it can be increasing with the production level, in some part it can be decreasing, okay? So in this type of non-convexities cause problems uh, if you want to find uh, uh, for the existence of a solution, okay? Okay, so very good. Um, now, um, let's, uh, uh, so the type of equilibria that uh, you uh, describe with this theory are what are called uh, uh, competitive equilibria, okay? And uh, we have already seen uh, 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 Okay, so we have already seen what uh, um, competitive means uh, when we uh, discussed the uh, Carnot, uh, Cournot oligopoly. So essentially, uh, uh, in this competitive equilibria, um, uh, you have a situation where essentially uh, neither the firms nor the consumers, they can manipulate the price by their own choices, okay? So there, uh, as I was describing, so both the consumers and the firms solve a problem uh, at fixed prices, okay? And uh, uh, so this is very interesting because it means uh, uh, that, um, Essentially, in an economy described in this way, every agent, every individual, both firms and both consumers are completely decoupled from each other. So the solution of the problem of Mr. I is totally independent of the solution of the prob problem of Mr. J. The only dependence uh, between these problems is that they solve a problem with the same, uh, at, at the same prices, okay? But otherwise there, are, there is no strategic uh, 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 issue here. Also the, like in game theory, no? In game theory, game theory are complex because uh, the utility function of uh, player I also depends on the strategy of player J. Here instead, uh, the utility of uh, consumer C does not depend on the utility of consumer uh, C prime nor on the profit of firms, okay? 
So, uh, and why is this, uh, when is this uh, um, assumption of uh, competitive uh, equilibria uh, justified? Well, uh, well, one case uh, we already see, we already saw when we studied the, the Cournot um, uh, uh, game, uh, the Cournot oligopoly. And what we saw there is that uh, if you have uh, uh, a situation where the number of firms is very, very large, then the dependence of the price on the choice of each of the firm is of order one over n. So the, the price uh, moves uh, by a very little uh, in response to each individual player or to each individual firm. And in the limit when uh, the number of firms goes to infinity, essentially the prices do not move at all, okay? And what we saw in that case is that uh, when uh, uh, firms optimize their output, uh, then you tend to uh, converge to a situation where the uh, uh, output adjusts in such a way that uh, the marginal cost of production is equal to the prices, okay? You can go back and, 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 and check uh, this, uh, this case. Okay, so, um, so now uh, what are the consequences, the general consequences uh, of uh, uh, competitive equity of this setting, okay? So if you have uh, uh, enough uh, assumptions on uh, say convexity properties, then uh, essentially uh, what you can generally show are some general results. Well, uh, one is, uh, um, uh, but the main ones are what are called uh, uh, welfare theorems. And this is what I would like to discuss. So there are two theorems. So the first one says that, uh, uh, say the equilibrium allocations in uh, uh, competitive uh, equilibria are Pareto efficient. Okay, so, um, so this is essentially a very powerful result. Uh, what it essentially says is that uh, um, if under uh, these conditions, uh, this system uh, where you have consumers and firm that uh, optimize uh, their uh, utilities and profits uh, under competitive markets, uh, then uh, we'll reach uh, a situation where uh, uh, you cannot have anyone uh, uh, being uh, better off without having someone else uh, worse off, okay? Which is essentially a Pareto optimal allocation of goods, okay? So uh, this is uh, sometimes uh, what goes uh, also under the name of uh, invisible end. So you see that essentially uh, you reach this uh, optimal uh, allocation of resources uh, um, just by letting markets uh, uh, do their job, okay? just by allowing trading uh, into markets uh, and if markets are competitive then uh, and, and prices are uh, adjusted uh, in the right way then uh, you will get this uh, uh, this invisible hand will uh, uh, give uh, to each uh, uh, participant in the economy an optimal allocation okay uh, so the second uh, result uh, is what is called, uh, um, uh, well, the second uh, welfare theorem. It says that uh, every 
Pareto optimal allocation can be realized um, as a, a competitive equilibrium with transfers. Okay, so what does it mean? So maybe uh, as, uh, as we told, as we discussed, uh, uh, so Pareto optimal allocation, they are optimal in the sense that no one can be better off without someone being worse off, but uh, they may not be uh, fair in the sense that uh, some uh, uh, individual may get a lot and some other individual may get very uh, little. So maybe you would like uh, uh, as a planner or as a, uh, as a social planner, you would like the society to converge to towards uh, uh, Pareto optimal uh, allocations that are more um, fair or say less unequal in society, okay? And what the second theorem of welfare, uh, uh, the second welfare theorem tells you is that essentially you can uh, do that uh, if you take uh, some of the endowments uh, of uh, some of the consumers and give it to some other consumer. If you can transfer the endowments uh, of the consumers uh, uh, from one consumer to the other, uh, uh, then uh, you can achieve uh, any Pareto optimal allocation. So this is the principle essentially of taxation, of uh, redistribution. So that says that if you uh, find, uh, uh, so for, for any possible uh, uh, Pareto optimal allocation that you want to achieve, there is uh, an optimal way to uh, introduce say taxes uh, on properties or endowments uh, that will uh, uh, enforce, uh, that will uh, uh, be such that uh, if you then let markets go, uh, if you can let just uh, people uh, uh, interact in competitive markets, then you will reach uh, that target uh, Pareto optimal allocation. Okay, so is this clear? I mean, at least the general, uh, uh, the general uh, uh, concept, okay? So these are, I mean, you, you can see these are really very powerful uh, results. Uh, and you can also see how much they have been uh, influential in the political economics uh, of uh, the last uh, century, at least, okay? Because essentially uh, this uh, have led to the idea that essentially you don't need, uh, you can let just market uh, uh, do their job and uh, markets uh, by themselves, they will uh, reach uh, say an optimal allocation for, for everyone, okay? Now, of course, to show this uh, uh, result in full generality is really, uh, not uh, feasible. So what I want to do is uh, uh, just to uh, discuss this result uh, in a very, very, very simple setting that is called uh, uh, a very simple economy where uh, essentially we have just uh, two consumers and uh, two goods, okay? So, uh, so this is just, uh, uh, so there are no producers, there are no firms here. So this is what is called uh, uh, exchange, uh, uh, exchange economy. Okay, so it's an economy where essentially, uh, yes, you, you, you don't have uh, uh, markets, firms, there are no firms, 
So everything that happens uh, is that uh, consumers uh, will exchange uh, goods uh, among themselves uh, and uh, in markets, okay, at, at fixed prices, okay. Okay, so uh, now, uh, <clears throat> how do we describe uh, uh, these two, uh, uh, this, this situation? Well, let's look at uh, um, uh, agent uh, individual one, okay, sorry. And what I'm going to draw is uh, um, the space of uh, uh, possible consumption sets for individual one, okay? So imagine that uh, uh, this is uh, say X1, amount of good uh, one, uh, this is amount of good two. And uh, let's say that uh, uh, this uh, is uh, the initial endowments, okay? So this point is uh, omega one one is how much agent one has uh, at the beginning. And this is uh, uh, how much uh, uh, agent one has uh, of good two at the beginning, okay? So you can think at this, uh, you can think at uh, X1 and X2 as, uh, as uh, apples and banana. And so uh, uh, consumer one uh, has uh, a certain number of trees of apples uh, uh that give them uh, give him uh, this many apples uh, and uh, a lower number of trees of banana that gives him uh, a lower endowment of bananas okay okay so uh, now uh, we have to describe what are the preferences of uh, uh, of this agent okay and these preferences are described by a uh, utility function Okay, let me draw it a little bit better. So this uh, utility function, uh, <clears throat> you can draw it in the third direction of the plane, but here what I am drawing is just uh, the, uh, the set of X uh, such that uh, the utility, sorry, uh, the utility, uh, the utility of X, uh, is equal of x1, the utility of agent one for, uh, is equal to uh, the uh, utility of his initial endowment, okay? So this is called uh, the indifference curve. So it means that all points up here are points uh, that agent one uh, prefers with respect to his endowment. And all these points here are points that are points uh, uh, that uh, for which E uh, prefers his endowment uh, to X for all the points that are on the other side of this, uh, of this line, okay? So it means that uh, uh, this uh, agent uh, would be uh, very willing to uh, get uh, any of uh, these points uh, up here, okay, in this uh, upper region, okay. So now let's imagine that uh, there is a um, that there is a, a market, and what the market does uh, is uh, it allows these uh, um, uh, consumer to trade uh, his goods, okay. So. Uh, so he can head, uh, so if he, he can change uh, 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 an amount delta x one of good uh, one at price p one with an amount uh, dex, delta x two of good uh, uh, p two, and uh, so he, he can sell delta x one. Imagine this is negative, and he can buy uh, a certain amount of uh, good two at this fixed price. So, but this uh, uh, must be, well, must be uh, non zip uh, so non, uh, um, uh, cannot be, uh, say, uh, positive, okay? 
So uh, essentially, if uh, we consider trades uh, of good one for good two at these uh, fixed prices here, then essentially this is uh, equivalent to uh, finding, uh, sorry, uh, to finding the uh, all the, so as a result of this, uh, this agent uh, can uh, reach all the points uh, that uh, are on this uh, on this line okay and you can see that uh, there are some points here uh, that are preferred by him uh, to uh, his initial endowment okay so if he can go to this market and buy uh, and exchange uh, his goods uh, at these prices uh, what is the point uh, where this guy uh, will um, uh what is the um how much he will buy of x2 in exchange of x1 well uh the answer to this is uh, that uh, this will correspond to the point uh, where uh, there is uh, indifference curves are tangent to the line of the prices okay because you can see that uh, uh so there will be no point that uh, is better, that allows him to get uh, a better, uh, a, a, a bundle of goods that he prefers with respect to this one, okay? And now you can also see that uh, if you change the prices, uh, if prices change, uh, then uh, eventually these, uh, uh, this amount of good will also change, okay? So and as, a, as a result of this, as a function, of, here you can see essentially that, that there will be a curve, okay, passing through all these points that, uh, um, that describe uh, what is the behavior of the agent as a function of the prices as these prices move as these prices move then uh, is optimal uh, uh, point would be essentially on this line okay very good so <clears throat> now let's get to uh, now this is just uh, agent one now what uh, well consumer one what consumer one has to do is to essentially uh, whatever he gets uh, this is a closed economy, whatever he gets, uh, it should be uh, given by uh, agent two, okay? So of course, uh, you can do the same picture also for agent two, for a consumer two, okay? So also for him, uh, you can draw uh, this, uh, um, these two uh, lines and, um, and uh, you can draw the indifference curves. Uh, imagine that uh, he starts uh, from uh, an initial endowment, which is up here. And then, uh, well, you, you can do exactly the same picture. And then uh, there will be another, uh, uh, say, line that describes uh, what is the optimal consumption of uh, uh, what is the optimal consumption of uh, agent two as a function of the prices, okay? Now, essentially, uh, this is uh, what you have to do is to find uh, uh, what uh, is the, um, to combine these two, uh, these two pictures here, okay? And the way to do this, uh, is essentially what is called uh, the Edgeworth box. Okay, so let me try to explain this. And the idea is that uh, now you take, uh, um, so uh, let me remove this. So you take uh, <coughs> this uh, uh, plot for consumer two and you turn it around uh, and you put it uh, uh, um, on the same plot uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, consumer one in such a way. So what you do is uh, uh, you uh, put this plot uh, 
exactly here, okay, you uh, say uh, turn it uh, around. So you uh, turn it around. And uh, <clears throat> in such a way that uh, this point, so that uh, this point here coincides with this point here, okay? So in other words, uh, that uh, um, this, uh, uh, this one is omega to two. So this uh, distance here is omega to two. And this distance here is omega to one. Okay. Now, if you uh, put on this uh, plot uh, also the indifference curve of uh, agent two, this one, then uh, essentially what you get uh, is, uh, is a picture like uh, this one. Okay. Well, now you see that uh, all the points uh, inside this region would be all points uh, that uh, both agent one and agent two prefer with respect to their initial endowment. Okay, so we have a question uh, on Pareto distribution. Uh, let me go back to this and finish this, uh, this thing, okay? So now um, <clears throat> you can um, also put the, uh, this uh, optimal uh, uh, curve for agent uh, 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 for consumer two on the same plot. And this uh, will essentially be, uh, say, a curve uh, that uh, will be essentially going uh, like this, okay? If I just mirror, uh, if I just mirror this uh, uh, thing here, okay, so you see now that uh, you have a point here, which is exactly the intersection of these two uh, lines. So this is when uh, the demand of consumer one matches exactly the demand of uh, consumer two. And what you can realize also is that uh, by the way in which I've been constructing these curves, this is uh, a point where the indifference curves of agent one and agent two are uh, both tangent to the same line, okay? So they have the same, uh, say, derivative, okay? So the same tangent, okay? So this is, uh, uh, so this is uh, essentially the uh, competitive uh, equilibrium in this case. And you can see that uh, it is also Pareto optimal because essentially no, uh, none of the two agents uh, can, uh, uh, can get uh, uh, a better, uh, can get a better deal without having the other one having a worse deal, okay? Now, um, so there are many other Pareto optimal uh, uh, allocations uh, in this economy. And these are all the points uh, that uh, as this point here share this property that the indifference curve of agent one of uh, uh, consumer one is tangent to the indifference curve of, uh, uh, of uh, consumer two. Okay, so for example, you may have uh, um, Another point uh, like this uh, up here, okay? Where the two curves, indifference curves, uh, they are tangent to each other, okay? And you can have uh, another point, uh, which is, uh, I don't know, uh, back here, okay? Now, if you join all these points, uh, okay? So if you join all these points, uh, this gives you uh, the, essentially uh, what is the set of all Pareto uh, optimal allocation or what uh, you can call the Pareto set, okay? Uh, now this uh, describes all the possible uh, uh, equilibrium, okay? 
So essentially, uh, so the fact that uh, you see by introducing uh, these uh, markets uh, and letting the prices uh, adjust in such a way that uh, um, it coincides with the demand of uh, both consumers, uh, you get essentially the first uh, uh, welfare theorem. Uh, uh, oh, I'll say welfare theorem. So that tells you that uh, um, the uh, competitive equilibrium is uh, uh, Pareto efficient. So the second, uh, 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 second welfare theorem tells you essentially that now instead of uh, uh, starting from these endowments, imagine that uh, you want to uh, realize, uh, uh, say, uh, this uh, particular equilibrium here. So what this tells you is that uh, there is a transfer of uh, uh, endowments uh, that you can make uh, between uh, agents one and agent two in such a way that uh, uh, the um, the equilibrium that uh, uh, you get, uh, the competitive equilibrium with these initial endowments goes exactly through this uh, Pareto optimal allocation, okay? And so this, the second uh, uh, welfare theorem tells you that uh, any uh, competitive equilibria can be uh, realized. With transfers, transfers are essentially changes in uh, uh, in the initial endowments. Okay, so this is essentially uh, the uh, what um, uh, I mean. The uh, just gives you a very uh, uh, say sketchy idea of uh, uh, general equilibrium theory. Uh, there is a little bit more uh, uh, details on the website, in the lectures that you find on the website, and even more details uh, on the um, uh, book of uh, Maskolen. But I hope that this, is, this can be a sort of uh, a, a map for you to understand what are the main concept and the main ideas. So let me get to this question. So, uh, so if wealth is Pareto distributed, distributed, wouldn't this mean that the assumption of consumers firms having non externality be uh, avoided? Some big players may influence others. No. So, no matter how, uh, uh, how say endowments uh, are distributed, if markets are competitive in the sense that uh, if firms uh, cannot manipulate prices, uh, no matter how big they are, then uh, uh, the allocation will be Pareto efficient, okay? So the, in the real economy, this is not so, in the sense that uh, uh, there are many situations in which uh, uh, big firms uh, have uh, monopoly power, on, uh, on particular markets, but um, if, uh, if, uh, if, uh, if the mic, mic which is uh, open, so uh, but if the conditions of uh, this welfare of, of the uh, general equilibrium are satisfied, then essentially, uh, even if you have a very an equal distribution of wealth, then uh, uh, that's uh, not going to be the case. Uh, uh, so can you show the analytical formula to get the Pareto set? Okay, so uh, as you see, the Pareto set uh, is, a, is a set uh, which is, uh, uh, um, so determined by the fact that uh, say the, um, the gradient uh, of the utility of agent one 
uh, at those prices must be equal to minus, uh, well, this is uh, with respect to conditions of agent one, should be minus the gradient uh, uh, with respect to uh, second player, the coordinates of the second player of U2 of P, okay? So what this tells you is that uh, the utility of agent one increases in this direction and the utility of agent two increases in this direction. And these are opposite directions, okay? Because both these two directions are orthogonal to the line of prices, okay? Is this clear, Yoresa? Okay, very good. So uh, couldn't get second welfare theorem. Uh, ah, you couldn't get uh, the second welfare theorem. Okay, so uh, uh, so okay, so um, now this is uh, has become a very messy picture. Okay, so this so uh, but within this picture, what I've tried to show is that uh, uh, if you start from a certain endowment. There is a unique point, uh, which is the competitive equilibrium that can be enforced by having a market uh, with these uh, specific prices, uh, which is such that uh, at this point, uh, the vector, say, the, say this uh, line of this straight line is tangent to both in different curves. Okay. Now, you can define a set of points uh, where this condition holds, where the uh, two indifference curves uh, of consumer one and consumer two are both tangent, okay? And these identify all these uh, yellow set, okay? Now, the second welfare theorem tells you that uh, if you have, uh, if you pick another point uh, on this uh, uh, set, okay? So there is, a, uh, there, is, there is at least one possible way to change the initial endowment to another point in such a way that the competitive uh, equilibrium of a market uh, with this initial endowment will exactly be this point here. Okay, is this clearer? So that for any point on the Pareto set, uh, you can find a transfer of uh, initial endowment that will uh, uh, lead you to this point uh, such that competitive markets will lead you to these points. Is this anything uh, more uh, clear? Okay, okay, thank you. So uh, other question, you uh, didn't find anything on StatMech of general equilibrium theory. Yes, this I was planning to uh, give you a, a, a little bit of uh, um, uh, some elements of this. Maybe what I will do is I will discuss this uh, in the next uh, lecture, okay? Which is uh, the day after tomorrow. Okay, so uh, because now time is over, and I think uh, there was already a lot of uh, material in this uh, in this lecture. What do you think? Okay, so. So it's not tomorrow, it's the day and after tomorrow, Colin or Benjamin. Okay, so I'll, um, so maybe we take uh, 10 minutes of break and then uh, reconvene uh, uh, for the next lecture, okay? Okay. <laughs>